So for this week's Just One Quilt Story, I've got Nick Ball, Quilts in the Attic. Mm -hmm. Shall we start with demystifying your name? Yes, <laughs> so um, I started quilting about six years ago and the only space that I had to do it in was a little attic room um, in our house. So it was brilliant actually because it was designed um, for student accommodation. So it had lots of long worktops, um, perfect for cutting and sewing. So the name stuck and here we are six years later. And what was it, what was that spark? Why did you start quilting? Um, I've always been crafty, so I kind of did lots of stuff with my nan when I was little. She taught me hand sewing and knitting, things like that. Um, she wasn't a quilter herself. Um, and then one day I randomly decided just to make a quilt. Um, I think it came from seeing them a lot on American shows and things like that. So bought some really cheap fabric and then made a first quilt, half square triangle, and just got bitten by the bug and it stuck. Have you got that quilt? Did you keep it? Or? I did, but it's not finished, so it's still a top. <laughs> Okay. You know, nestled away somewhere, but I think I'll always have it as a reminder. When I started quilting, I was, you know, a novice, as most of us are. I had no idea what fat quarter was, what a jelly roll was, all this terminology just coming at me. Um, so I followed a lot of tutorials, online blogs, things like that. Um, but I was just becoming a little bit bored, if I'm honest, with what I was making. So whilst I enjoyed the process of actually making and sewing, um, the things that I, I, I was finishing and ending up with weren't really inspiring to me at all. So um, the, this quilt kind of came about um, in a sort of odd random way that has kind of become a, a story to tell at like weddings and weird parties. Um, so I was in work looking through a magazine supplement on my lunch break and there was a recipe for a leek tart and there was a picture of this leek that had been sliced ready to go into this tart and you could just see the patterns of the leek within it. Um, and I was so taken by that image that all I could think about was how could I replicate that in fabric. Um, so I went home, raided the scraps, um, I didn't really have a lot of fabric back then so I just rummaged and picked what I could and ended up with this. Um, this leak block here. Again, I had no idea what improv was at that time, but I just knew that the sort of block that I wanted to make and this idea of creating and replicating in some way this pattern, um, there wasn't gonna be a traditional block to do that. I do credit this one block in particular as the sort of starting point of my love and obsession with improv. Um, and then other vegetables followed, so um, the cabbage and then the carrot, and then finally the tomato coming together to make this one quilt, this vegetable patch quilt, which has kind of become my trademark in a way, and I've kind of been tagged with the words the vegetable quilt man or the veg man, which is if you're not a quilter and you're not aware of this quilt and you're just maybe over here in the conversation, I do get some funny looks. Everybody in life, whatever your pursuit, it's nice to have your hand held sometimes. Um, with quilting, you know, there's that familiarity of a pattern. People have done it before, it's tried and tested. Um, with improv, all of that is thrown out the window, so it can be quite quite daunting and intimidating to even know where to start. Um, when I talk and do workshops and things, that's the biggest sort of like sticking point for people is just knowing how to get past that very rigid, organised way of thinking. Um, but with something like this quilt, when there isn't a pattern and you're just kind of going off your own ideas, you have to be willing to, to take that leap. Um, that you know be faithful and have that leap of faith and, and know that you know what you're trying may not work and you may have to go back to the drawing board but you've tried it you've learned you've grown as a quilter um, and I think that's what's important in sort of improv for me is just giving it a go. I do find myself in a bit of a constant battle with perfectionism and being a perfectionist um, I'm the first to put my hands up and say that I am a perfectionist um, and people say to me, how can you be an improv quilter and have this relationship with perfection? Um, but for me, perfection isn't about everything being perfect. It's more of a personal perfection in the fact that I want to look at a piece and go, that's as perfect as I am able to make it. Um, and it's funny with this one quilt, when I made the um, cabbage block, which even to this day is probably one of the most difficult things I've ever had to make. It was very labour intensive, there was lots of you know cursing, there were scraps everywhere, the iron was on full blast. Um, and in my mind, this cabbage had to be entirely red or the shades of an actual red cabbage. Um, and it was only when I was quilting the piece that I could see this tiny little snippet of green here that had somehow gotten into the, into the piece. And for a long time, I couldn't reconcile with that. I was like, oh, I must rip it out, I have to get rid of it. But now it has actually become my little bit of perfection in this quilt. And I, I love that, that that is there in the story that it tells. Do you have quilts in your home? Are quilts part of your life? 
uh, yeah, obsessed with quilts. So they're either sort of on a bed as a utility piece. Um, the dog has his own one in his basket. Um, and then others are sort of hanging on the wall. We have favorites that we rotate out and um, others are just put into a cupboard, but there isn't a room in the house, I don't think, that doesn't have a quilt in it. I do kind of ponder the, the, the shelf life and the, you know, the legacy of my own work, um, and not from any place of ego, but just to, to wonder whether they will last and whether they might end up in, in someone's collection or in, you know, someone might even find it in a thrift store or in a, you know, a junk shop or whatever. But um, I think I've become a lot more conscious about making a mark on my own quilt, so not necessarily a physical label, but just sort of creating a body of work that possibly is representative of me, and people can look at it and go, oh yes, that's, and then hopefully that will be passed down, and they will live on, and they will be used and admired and enjoyed, and, 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 and have, a, have a legacy, however, however small. I would say drop any preconceived ideas you have of quilting. Um, like anything, there is maybe possibly a sort of a bit of an elitist attitude or something that, you know, that is not right or is a stereotypical approach to that, um, to that craft or whatever it is. So I would say go in with an open mind um, and kind of just forge your own path. Um, yes, you need help at the beginning, there are tutorials and all sorts of things like that, but if you can kind of take it and run with it, um, I think you'll, you'll be all the better for it and the experience will be something that you may want to carry on with. No one makes just one quilt, do they? No. Ask me, ask my house, ask the dog, ask my partner, the house is full. No, it's an addiction. <laughs>